trying to sing strongly to my mom. I understand sitting there alone being being tough, so you don't have to worry about it. Welcome to this gathering of Window Christian Church, and we're really glad to have you all here in the sanctuary. Those of you on Zoom, Facebook Live, and I know some people will be watching it later. Today, we're going to add another element back, get closer to the old normal or a new normal, hopefully a new normal. Um, after the communion hymn, the deacons will come forward and pass the communion elements out. So to receive it, we'll still be using the the ones contain the bread and the cup together, but we'll pass it. We're wanting to preserve as much as we can the reality that the gospel is brought to us by others. We were all in a place, some raised in homes where you received the gospel from where you were born, but everyone had to receive the gospel from someone. 
you had to learn that all of those doubts in your mind about being lovable, people might have sold you the goods on, was actually untrue in the heart and mind of God. We had to be told the good news that we can feel separate from God, but that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Somebody had to tell us the good news that when we were feeling alone, that God was present with us and alive in the spirit. Somebody had to tell us the good news. So as we pass the elements of the Lord's Supper, the deacons pass them, in, pass them out. Remember that that is symbolic of you receiving the good news from someone else. And then when you hand it to the next person, that is symbolic of you being the one who hands the good news, who passes on the good news of Christ to others. For we are receiving, sharing, and giving Christ as we meet together today. So I'm looking forward to us enacting that on this day. I'm really glad that you're here. Today we're going to be talking about the joys of sharing Christ, and I hope that your heart is open not only to the ways you can remember people sharing Christ with you, but the ways in which we share Christ here, and the ways in which we will share Christ to our neighbors, our friends, and even our enemies as we follow Christ together. Let's share a welcome this morning. Welcome, all who are here. Welcome. Love you guys. Welcome, my physical, mental, and spiritual self to this moment. Welcome. Welcome, spirit of the risen Christ among us. Welcome. Together, we willingly enter communion one with another. Welcome. Let's sing you. to worship. Those who love Jesus keep his words. Those who know Jesus will know his peace. Come, follow and love Jesus our Lord who has come to be among us. And let's share a hymn of praise, you servants of God.
Lord, we saw the candles lit at the beginning. We were reminded that in the midst of our busyness, we may have forgotten your presence. The candles burn, reminding us that you are present, always present. You were present in the week that has just ended. Some of us have been through struggles, trials, hardships. We've come here for a reminder that we're not alone, we're encouragement, we're healing, for all that you would do in our lives as you save us from ourselves and all that the world has done and will be doing to us and our neighbors. We're all meeting right here with you present. We're all approaching the table, everyone invited to participate, to receive you through your son, Jesus Christ, and the bread and the cup. So be with us in this present moment. Be with those who in this moment are struggling. For those of us who have been through weeks with goodness, with things that brought us joy, with experiences of your love and grace, through your word and through prayer, through the lives and words of others, we ask that you would receive our gratitude and in this moment continue to encourage us as we find those good days happening as well. And fill us with your spirit and help us to receive with gratitude the bread and the cup, your son, Jesus Christ. And help us in this time to listen deeply, for there are people who long for exactly who we are and what we have to give. There are people who are missing, who need to be here because we are the place that you have for them to grow. Grow to know your love and to to share your love and to give your love to our community. So be with us in this time. Give us eyes and ears and hearts that are open to you. Pray that you would help us to become the people who embody and fulfill the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Uh, today's children's sermon, be remembering back in April of 1972 when I came to know Jesus as my Lord. Came to know Jesus through two things. One is the invitation my grandmother gave me that whenever I'm at the end of my rope to call out to God because God would always be there. I had what was at that point the worst day of my life and I won't go into that detail. But I reached out to God in prayer and my grandma was ready. And I had uh, had a fight with my best friend, Craig. And when I apologized to Craig, he said, that's all right, let's play ball. And we went and played basketball. He forgave me instantly. And the next thing I did, that was on a Saturday, I asked Craig where he went to church. He said he went to First Baptist Longview, Texas. And so the next day on Sunday, I went to First Baptist Church, Longview, Texas received Christ and was baptized in that church. We're reading a story today about Paul. I'm not really sure exactly how my grandma came to know Jesus or how Craig came to know Jesus. I don't remember that. Craig may have told me. My grandma may have told me. I don't really remember. But I do remember that they showed up and they were the ones who helped me know Jesus. In the story we're looking at, Lydia has Paul show up. She was looking and he delivered the message. And what I'd just like to say to all of us, you may be Craig, you may be Grandma, you may be Paul. 
your friends at school, at work. They're waiting for someone to tell them how much they're loved by God. You can be the one to tell them. Amen. Let's look at our prayer time this morning. <clears throat> I understand that Debbie Best, who we've been praying, um, coming out of her thyroid surgery, has been having some complications, and so we want to be let's lift Debbie up in prayer. She continues to recover and or be restored to health. Also, Jean Poole, who we've prayed for in the past, she has done well with her battle with cancer, but I learned this morning that her sister died this past week. So, be remembering Jean and her family in passing with her sister. Any other updates or additions to the prayer? See, yeah, Melanie. Okay, thank you. Uh, Melanie's just telling us that Tom, who had been who has been diagnosed with a form of muscular dystrophy, is doing really well. So we can continue to pray for him in our hearts to take him off the prayer list, and if he has future episodes of change, we'll. Teresa. Thank you, Teresa. Teresa's asked us to pray for her Uncle Bob and Aunt Linda who had some health issues with the hospital. Vicky, oh, I thought you were. Oh, it was <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Marty. Right, we have been praying for Erie Knot, and she let us know we can take her off the prayer list. She was even with us in worship last week. Thank you, Marty and Michelle. What's his last name? Okay. Who's that? Uncle Pat. What's his last name? Okay. <laughs> Michelle's wanting us to pray for her Uncle Pat. We can take Kramer off the prayer list. But we're going to pray for her Uncle Pat. She's going to give me the spelling later. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Ben.
Yeah, well, we will. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, that's good. Uh, ben wanted us to keep praying for Carl Holt, who's attended our church some, uh, but he was moved from Oliver House, which is local, to um, a, a facility in Raleigh. We want to. Ben wanted to be grateful that he's come back to church after being out for a while with challenges in his own life, but is celebrating the support that the church has given him. And he's had conversations with two men, Charles and Jack, who are struggling and need to follow the Lord. He wants us to pray. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I'd like to ask y'all to, to pray for me as I go to the doctor tomorrow. I have my boot on, and tomorrow we find out if it's physical therapy or surgery. And um, uh, I really want it to be physical therapy so it doesn't cramp all the plans that I have with my grandchildren between now and the fall. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to avoid that. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have a time of silent prayer, and then I'll voice a prayer. Lord, thank you that you know our hearts, you know everyone on our hearts, you have on yours. People who are around the world are struggling, struggling through hard times, struggling to notice you in the middle of good times. I pray that you would be with us and help us to not only hold people in prayer as they go through all that life gives them, but that they would go through all of it with all that you wish to give them your spirit and your love, your grace, and that we would become the people who bring relief to them. We lift up all that's going on in our world in places of conflict and need, struggles that we're aware of in the news, and all those struggles that just don't get to our attention. We ask that you would help us to be the answer to prayers, that you would be with folks like Charles and Jack, and we hope that you would be helping us to go and reach the people who need your love. Be with us now. Fill us with your spirit. Enable us to be your body in Jesus' name. out of time communion pray that everyone here will receive the bread and the cup not because you were able to get fully prepared because right now you know christ has prepared the table not because you come here without having any sin unconfessed or without the purity of heart that you might be moving toward but that you would understand that jesus has come without sin and with the full purity of his heart so we are received because of who Christ is to us and who we are to Christ. Because as the father received the prodigal son with joy and celebration, so Christ receives us when we come to the table, the bread and the cup, knowing that we have come from wherever we've been to be back together in Christ and in love with each other, this love of Christ that we share. So I pray that you would experience that and find in your heart the longing to help others know the same. In the name of Christ, we come to this communion. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of communion, Jesus Calls Us for the Truth.
Let us pray. Loving and merciful Father, as we come to the table today and break this bread, help our thoughts to move towards Jesus on the cross and think of his broken body that was given in salvation for us to be able to have eternal life. We ask now that you fill our hearts with the love that you have so that we may come through this week showing that love to others who need it so desperately. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I was afraid he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Often as you do this, do it in remembrance. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to this communion table with praise and thanksgiving for the wine, which represents the spilt blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, please continue to be with us as we pray our unique individual prayers, as well as our prayers as a congregation, that we will listen and be receptive to your will out to, as to how to most effectively serve our community as well as each other today and ongoing. And we name you, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The same way he took the cup and he blessed it and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. We come now to our time of offering. We pray that this would be a time when we not only recognize God as the source of everything, but that, uh, that we'd recognize ourselves as stewards of everything we've been entrusted with. We get to decide what to do with the breath and the words and the actions of our lives. We get to decide what to do with the amount of resources and finances that are ours. What we want to do is to be faithful, to love ourselves, to love the people in our households, our families, and our communities. And one of the sure ways that we will do that by maintaining for ourselves, our families, our community, the witness of Christ in this church and in the churches that preach Christ around the world. So we receive this offering in the faithfulness of God and as an expression of our own faithfulness to the glory of God. Amen. Let's stand and sing our ducks out. Scripture reading this morning is from Acts 16, 9 through 15. And I told George a minute ago, it's one of my favorites. And uh, it's all my favorite, but that one is one especially dear to my heart. In Acts 16, uh, verses 9 through 15. If you have your Bible, follow along with me as I read from God's holy and inspired word. During the night, a vision appeared to Paul. A Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to sell out, set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to evangelize them. That's Luke speaking. Then uh, settling, setting sail from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. The next day to Nepalus, and, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony. 
which is the leading city of that district of Macedonia. We stayed in that city for a number of days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate by the river where we thought there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God was listening. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was spoken by Paul. After that, after she and her husband were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. This morning, I'd like to talk about the joys of sharing Christ. You know, Paul in this story is following Christ. He's not only following Christ in his own personal life, but he's with a group of people who are following Christ. I don't know if you've ever been on a journey, a big adventure, on a hike. Um, I got lost in Natchez Trace in Mississippi one time when I was in eighth grade. Um, you know, the leader said, stay with us, stay on the trail, don't get too far ahead. Yeah, you can guess what I have. Um, I didn't stay, I got too far ahead, and I did not stay on the trail. I had a confrontation with a deer running through the woods, which before I realized what it was, I thought it was a mountain lion and I was going to die. And I was, I was scared to death by a snake, which turned out to be a blue runner and not anything dangerous. But anyway, um, what I can tell you is that it's very important if you want your life to go as it will when it's safe and in the right place, you need to not get too far ahead of your own wisdom, the wisdom you've been given and uh, stay with others, stay with the people who are following God. Paul was following God. Paul was following Christ. He was seeking the will of God. He had already decided to follow Christ as Lord. He had done that on the Damascus Road. He was making that shift and was going from his life as a Pharisee to his life as an apostle to the Gentile. Paul was following Christ, and he was seeking God's will. There was this other person at the same time, Lydia. Uh, she was looking for God. She was worshiping God with, with the knowledge that she had. She was worshiping God, and she was there in a place where she and Paul, the others with Lydia and the others with Paul, would, would come together, and when coming together, they would share Christ, and I am wanting us to see the joys that were happening there and the joys that we have and can share with one another and with others that we may already know. First off, we can all have and follow the vision God gives us. It's not anything unique to Paul that you, that you and I can't also uh, participate in. We can actually have an understanding of what God wants us to do. We can actually have an experience that God is calling us to something, that there's something that, that seems to make sense out of how we understand ourselves and how we understand the world and a place for us to serve. I remember when I was 14 years old and started my Christian walk. I remember when I was 17 and I felt a call into the ministry. But in the midst of my life between 14 and 17, and since I've been 17, I would just like to tell you that my, my life, like all of your lives, is spent deciding, do I just run ahead and confront the deer slash mountain lion, terrible snake slash blue runner, or do I stay where God wants me to stay and stay on the trail as God would have me stay on? I'm convinced that I would have done better if I hadn't got off the trail so much. I'm convinced that we can know the will of God. Now, how you receive your word from God and your commission, your calling, and how I do it doesn't have to be the same way. You understand that, right? I mean, you really don't need to say, well, George, God doesn't talk to me that way. And like, That's fine. That's just, that's just fine. I can remember seeing my parents communicate without words. Now Tammy and I do it. I think it's pretty cool. I'll say something, she'll look at me, and I'll go, I know what that means. Stop saying that kind of stuff. Be quiet. You're, you're speaking. I know what her look means. Or it might mean, I, that's really beautiful, George. That, that's a good, good point. You know, or somewhere in the midst of all those other glances, 
she has her mama look and her teacher look. And uh, some of y'all know what those are. How we receive the vision of God. How does God look at us and how do we see God? How does God talk to us? How do we hear God? I don't need to give you exactly how to do it, but it will be within the thing called prayer. However you learn to pray, it will be within the thing called listening to the word of God. It will be a way in which in your eyes, ears, and heart, you and I each and together come to hear, see, understand, and give ourselves to following God individually and together. Each of us needs to follow God, and we together need to follow God. And the group that we have formed called Shaping Our Future Together in Christ is trying to just help us, invite us to talk so that we could see what is ours to do as a church, which translates into how each of us has a calling within our calling as Window Christian Church. Now, let's remember that, you, that uh, when you get a call, you, God starts where you are to take you where he wants you to go. I know that's, that sounds like too simple to have to say, but I'm telling you that a lot of, a lot of us might have the same instinct I do, which is, when I see where I'm supposed to go, I translate that as you should have already been there. And I feel guilty. Instead of the next thing God has for me that grace would tell me, I hear you're supposed to match up to all of this. And I can remember uh, going to hear Billy Graham speech, speak, and I heard him say, if one person would give themselves totally to God, the world would be different. And I remember sitting there just as sincere as I could going, I'll be that one. That's what I'll do. <laughs> well, that sounds funny to me now, but... I was sincerely asking God, you know, what would it be like for someone to be fully committed? And it turns out that God does not change the world by one person changing their life. God changes the world through all of us together being transformed. And remember, second person plural. Read your Bible, and when you see you, it's almost always second person plural. So it's y'all. Y'all, when y'all do the will of God, the kingdom of God comes. Not when one person gets nice. But when we share that love with each other. So here's Paul. Let's remember some things about Paul. Paul, he was Jewish. Let's remember something about Lydia, Gentile. How did that go? Was that a likely pairing? Eh, not really. Let's remember also Paul was a Pharisee. So not only a Jew, but a Pharisee. I mean, a really strict keeping the law kind of Jew. Now, and, and Lydia, a God, a God worshiper. She was by the river, prayed. And you can see if Paul hadn't been changed by Jesus Christ, him walking up as a Pharisee and her saying, I want to know God, and him saying, well, here's 10 commandments. Here's 613 positive commands, there, prohibition. And if you sit down and listen long enough, we'll teach you how to keep the 613. And if you do that faithfully, then you'll have the blessing of God. And oh, by the way, you're a woman, so talk to your husband. And now he comes to Lydia. And here's Lydia. What do you think Lydia, who actually had the confidence to be seeking God, running her own business, sitting beside a river, if that Pharisee unchanged and walked up to her, I think it would have been a different kind of encounter. There she is. She's thinking, I'm finding God. Somewhere or another, this God is there calling me, see, luring me, moving us here. I'm worshiping, and I'm waiting to see the next thing God has for me. Paul was a Jewish Pharisee, and she was a woman seeking God, a Gentile, and a woman who was the head of her household. Because, you see, when she decided to follow Jesus as Lord, she went back and her household followed. I, I'm just telling you, Pharisee Paul would have been like, that's not the way that's supposed to work. The woman isn't supposed to be the leader, the business owner or the leader. And yet Paul comes to that in his own growth spiritually. So what I, what I want you to understand and for me to be reminded of and us all to be reminded of is that you have to perceive the word of God as God is showing you the difference between how you see things and how God sees things, how you hear things and how God hears things, how you work and live in life and how God works and lives in life. And I'm just telling you that there would have been a time prior to their spiritual hunger and the life of the spirit in their lives where Paul and Lydia would not have had such a cordial and uh, encounter. And yet there they are. Remember that God's vision is not the old one. 
God's vision is not one that doesn't include and fulfill the old. It simply does not stay the same way it has been. It is not the status quo. It's not continuing the same power systems with the same injustices. It is a path to, the vision of God is a path to the kingdom of God. Your way of helping us get to that path, my way and our way together towards what God has for us. How does God show us God's vision? See if you agree with it. There's more clarity offered by God than we are taking the time to find. God wants us to know more of how to live life than we're really wanting to know. Y'all think that's basically true? And the other thing is, I think God's life is more in our world and in our lives than we're telling about. I've had people sit down with me in my office and tell me about their walk with God, and they'll, they'll say, I don't tell many people this. It sounds kind of strange, but I think God told me that it. You see what they're saying? I don't tell many people this. I know you're going to think it's strange. I can just see, I can see Moses like, Moses, are you going to lead us out of the promised land? Nope, nope, nope. Didn't something happen up there when you were out with the sheep? And something? Nope, nope. It was weird. You'd never believe it. You're not, just, you're not going to believe it. Um, so the, but I, in your sleep the other night, you were saying, God said, lead, lead them out of Egypt. Why, why were you saying that in your sleep? Well, I'm just, just never mind. I'm, a, I'm an Egyptian. I'm not, I'm not an Israelite. I'm an Egyptian. And, and we laugh because, I think because it sounds familiar. There have been many times in my life, I, first it started happening between ages 14 and 17 for sure, when I was in the adolescent years of peer pressure, and I, on many occasions, failed to be the person I think God called me to be because the peers told me to be the person they wanted me to be. And it turns out that those paths didn't work out well in the short term or the long term. There is a path for the clear, for the will of God. God is willing and ready to show us, but we must be willing to listen. Second thing is sharing Christ will send us to people, save our souls and create communities of Christ's love. If you listen to God's word and God calls you, God's going to call you to people. And maybe to somebody that surprises you. God's going to call you to people. God's going to save our souls. And I'm sorry to say that many people, when they hear save our souls, means go to heaven when you die. And I'm not wanting to debate eternal security. That's, that's good. But that is not the full meaning of salvation. Jesus didn't come so that we could go to heaven when we die. He came so that we would be transformed into the kingdom of God that he preached. He actually, Jesus of Nazareth, believed. We don't know much about him, Jesus of Nazareth. We have some Jesus Christ in the scriptures, and we have much about the Christ, because the Christ was anticipated in the Old Testament and the Hebrew scriptures and is, and is alive now. But Jesus of Nazareth, we don't know that much about. But here's a few things, if you go and study the Jesus Seminar or the historical Jesus movement and all these people, the scholars that look the best they can at who Jesus of Nazareth really was. You want to hear what, he, what they really clear he said? It, they really clear he said he believed the kingdom of God was coming right now, that he was bringing about, announcing, and ushering in the kingdom of God, and that his people would do the exact same thing he did. They know that's what Jesus of Nazareth said, and he got killed for it, and then his followers started talking about him being risen. And it turns out that the people who were talking about him being risen formed communities and did what Jesus did. And now when people look at the church and point out how the church is not like Jesus, people get defensive. And the early church was like Jesus. We will be called to people, people that may surprise us. Jesus hung out with people that surprised others. If you're the Messiah, why are you hanging out with her? If you're the Messiah, why are you hanging out with him? If you're the Messiah, why are you hanging out with those kind of people? I'm so glad those kind of people were in because that's me. That's my people, the Gentiles, the people who wander away. Notice he has a vision. He has a vision of a man from Macedonia, and the man from Macedonia pleads with him, and what's the plea? 
come over here. You're, you're over there. Come over here and tell us and help us. Hmm. How are we going to come over there? Individually and collectively. Who in our sphere of influence needs Christ? And how will we go over there? Any vision we have as a church, any vision we have as individuals will involve us going to the people who are waiting and hungry to know Jesus. I wish uh, I was at a leadership meeting at my second church, at uh, Woodland Baptist Church, and we were doing a vision uh, process like we're doing here. And we were talking about outreach. And we said, what can we do uh, to reach the people? And uh, we'd had some people showing up from the trailer park that was on Purnell Road. And, uh, and they weren't like the rest of the people in the church. And their children were loud and unruly. They didn't know how to act in church. And I, we were having this debate about, you know, do we really want people in here who don't know about reverence? And, and then I said, well, what are we going to do? And one, one man said, he later came to different understandings, but at that point, the man actually said, we have welcome on our sign. They can come if they want. Well, what I want you to understand is that we will keep welcome on our sign, won't we? And we will do, as Ellen said, Ellen was in my small group. We had a, a regional meeting of Disciples of Christ uh, yesterday online, and uh, I thought it was just listen to, the, listen to the speaker speak. So I had my hat on and my sweaty T-shirt because I was doing yard work before and the, and the breaks and after. And I was sitting there watching, and all of a sudden, they're like, we're putting you in breakout groups. And I was like, well, I started to sign off, and then I thought, no, I'm not going to wimp out. So I put on, I had my hat on, and I was like, hi, I'm the pastor at Window Christian Church. I'm George Fuller. Uh, but in one of my groups was a lady named Ellen. It's from Goldsboro, and she, she, she said, with deep emotion, I don't know that I saw her tears falling, but she had deep emotion said, we really need to get everyone to come to communion. We all need to be in Jesus together. Preach, sister. I told her I reserved the right to quote you tomorrow. She said that was all right. Paul's a Pharisee. He ends up reaching a Gentile. Paul was a man with clear understanding of roles of men and women, and he ends up giving the gospel, and starting a church with a woman. Lydia became one of them. Lydia became one of them. Lydia, this Greek woman, business owner, became one of Paul's people. Paul sacrificed and changed. How will we translate the gospel and take the gospel to the people in our lives and in our community who need to know it? How will you translate one of the things I have observed is that churches tend to want people to convert three times rather than just once. There's the conversion to Christ that we would all agree on. But then in addition to that, we want you to convert to understanding, and appreciating and connecting with God through our music, not yours. We want you to come and understand and communicate with God and understand God in our vocabulary, not yours. So you have to convert three times. If you want to really experience God with us, you have to really work hard to reculturate yourself in our Christian culture that we've built. And I'm telling you that that's not what happened on the river when Paul met Lydia. They started talking. I'm sure Paul didn't start quoting Hebrew scriptures in Hebrew to her. She didn't know Hebrew. She was a Greek. I'm sure that they had conversations, and the conversation was, let me get you to my synagogue. But let me introduce you to the living Christ who's here. And not only that, you, did you know? Right after that, he ends up in prison. Paul and Silas end up in prison. You remember what happened? They end up uh, singing in the prison cell at night, and there's an earthquake, and the, the jailer notices they didn't escape, and they become he becomes believers. So you got Lydia's household, the jailer's household. And then if you go to read in Philippians 
chapter 1, when he writes a letter to Philippi, he's thanking God for the beautiful way that Christ, that Christ's love is known in the church in Philippi. This encounter turns into a church of Gentiles loving and serving God in Philippi. So I think one of the keys in saving our souls and moving us towards people and creating a community of love is simply to stop and open up our hearts to God, to one another, open up our hearts to our neighbors, open up our homes, not only our home here, our church home and these facilities, but, but invite people to meet with us in the places where we gather, our homes and in the community. And when we are there, pay attention to who's seeking God and be ready to give witness to how you have found God. Who is being saved out of your soul work? Who is coming to know Christ and their lives being transformed as part of your life in Christ and my life in Christ? And then another question, who's worth the trouble? Yeah, y'all do know that some people are harder to hang out with than others. You do know you, you get stretched more by some personalities and people from some cultures than, than others, but who's worth the trouble? And when somebody knows you're worth the trouble, I have a friend, Scott Shackleton. He is part of a Sunday night group that meets at our house. We've been meeting for over five years. Every Sunday night we share a meal and we're hanging out. We're not all from the same church, but we're all following Christ, and we live in the same area, so we, we meet each week, and I think our youngest now is three years old, and our oldest is, well, you know where she sings here. Um, then, and so um, well, Scott uh, and his wife adopted five children and had two of their own, and the five children were not of the same race as the two of his own. And they have been raised and have been loved. And they had many challenges. Some of them had challenges that predated their birth because of the state of the life of their moms that gave them birth. What I see in Scott is that the gospel is being lived out in the lives of other people who were invited into his life and he adjusted his life constantly and still does to incorporate them and who they are and where they came from. And I just want to honor that. And to one degree or another, you know, if you're going to go to Columbia, South America to preach the gospel, you learn Spanish. And if you're going to go next door and talk to them about Jesus, you have to learn to speak in the way, maybe the same English language, but speak in the way and, under, and help them understand the love of God in the way that they can hear. The third thing is that Wendell Christian Church is looking and listening for God's vision. So I asked the question today, are we open? Are we listening? Are our hearts open? Notice in the passage that, that Ben read, it says that concluding that God had called us, we went with Paul. Paul has the vision, and then they and then the the people, uh, people say, and includes Luke, the author, when we, we became convinced, God, we were concluding that God had called us to go, and that is what we're seeking. We're not seeking the vision that one person has. We're seeking a vision we can all share, because while Paul was part of a group, and I'm part of you, and you're part of us, we're all in it together, we're also deciding, when is God calling us? Because you can follow Paul's life. And there were times when people that were with him went on with him. People that were with him didn't go on with him. It was a wide variety of ways Paul kept following God and others followed God. The world was transformed by people following the vision God gave them, not by following an individual. And Paul says later that the reason I know you're immature is you say, I'm a Paul, I'm of Silas, I'm of Apollos. You're following men, and it's all Christ. And so for us, we come to Christ again. The last thing, imagine our fears being gone. Take a big deep breath. Imagine our fears, your fears and my fears being gone. And we're secure in eternal life, now and forever. Secure. 
Imagine our loneliness dissipating and we never feel alone because the vibrancy of the spirit and the fellowship of Christians is so much a part of our lives that we're never alone again. Imagine our depression becoming a sense of adventure because while we long, while we lament and long for meaning, we find meaning and we find how we can be part of something big and beautiful. And even though it's unknown in some ways, it's, it's an adventure because we're secure with who's with us on the adventure. So first, we must let Christ do this for us. If we feel overly challenged by witnessing to other people, I'm convinced we need to come back and, and let God take away our fears. Let God renew our commitment to the fellowship of believers and let God show us that we're on an adventure that is secure for now and forever. When our mayor was with us on Thursday, she shared ways in which faith communities can be part of our, uh, uh, our town. And we're collecting the list. And I just want to tell you one thing. The good news is we're not going to do it all. <laughs> and the even better news is there'll be something for us to do. We are going to know what it is for us to do in our community. We will know our calling. So let's imagine our neighbors. Imagine our neighbors seeking God. Some of them might not even know that's what they're seeking. They just know they're desperate. And what they have in their life right now doesn't solve and, and calm their, de their desperation. Some people might just be desperately alone. And that people around in their lives don't end their loneliness because they feel alienated, even from the people in their lives. Imagine our neighbors. Maybe tonight when you're sleeping, you wake up and remember your dream. Don't be afraid to tell people or someone in your imagination or in a dream, in some way in a vision, says, here's someone for you to go reach. Notice it was a man from Macedonia that called, and who did he find? A woman from Thyatira. Isn't that great? God not only calls us, but continues to show us more and more of what God wants for us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your love and for the joy of sharing you in our lives, the joy of having you and sharing you with one another, and for the joys of being able to go and tell others and watch in their lives as your love transforms them. Help us to turn to you for our own fears. Help us to turn to you for our own discouragements. Help us to turn to you in our times of loneliness and find you present. And help us to help one another right here in this fellowship to be confident that we can turn to one another in our fears, in our loneliness, in our depressions, in our struggles, and find that you show us how to love one another. Help us to be better and better at that, and help us to understand that we already have pure love in your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of commitment, Lord, you give the great commandment.
that if you've made any commitment in this time or if the Spirit speaks to you and you have a vision along during the week, uh, I would love, the elders would love, there are other people in your life I think would love to hear about it. So in every way that God speaks to you, share with your other brothers and sisters the commitment that you're making. Pray that others who are around us and in our midst will choose to become members of this church and join us in serving Christ in our community here. If you would, place your hand on your heart and be reminded that Christ takes residence within you, giving you not only your true identity, but your true calling. So now go and show them who you really are the you that is expressed as Christ, and go and tell them the good news, the love of Jesus Christ, to the glory of God. Amen. Remember, we have the devotion Wednesday mornings at 7.30 on Zoom and Facebook Live, and we also have the Bible study at 10.30 here in the